Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. Today is January 17, 2024. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society, and uh, really, really happy to be here with another member of Fahrenheit 451, legendary Bronx hardcore band. Um, so, Kevin, why don't you go ahead and say a little bit about yourself before we get into things. Hi, uh, Kevin Smith, uh, bass player for Fahrenheit 451, um, and quite a few other bands. Um, originally from the South Bronx, and happy to go. All right. Thanks, Kevin. You're really happy that you're here. Um, so why don't you start off by talking a little bit about your family history and background and uh, whatever you might know about how they ended up in the Bronx. Um, well, it's two sides of the family like every other family. You've got your mom's side, you've got your dad's side. Um, dad's side, as far as I know, they were originally from uh, Trinidad, Tobago, and Jamaica. Um, I had a grandfather who went into the military years, 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 years back. And um, he went in, he went in as enlisted personnel. He was able to get commissioned by going to school to become a doctor. Um, he ended up becoming a heart doctor for the military. He ended up becoming a colonel. He got stationed over in Germany. And that is where he met my grandmother who from there on, that side of the family to where I led to came from there. Um, we still have family members in Germany and um, in the islands as well. I just found out recently that I've got other family that emigrated to the northern parts of Europe, uh, Sweden, Norway, uh, Denmark, and a bunch of other places from that side as well. Um, on my mom's side of the family, they're from Dominican Republic. Um, they emigrated excuse me, to New York City, obviously before I was born. Um, my mom and my dad met in the weirdest of ways. My mom was going to school. Catherine Gibbs was the name of the school. Lenny's sister, I think, actually might have gone there. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, she was going to be like an administrative assistant. And mind you, this was back in the 70s. Yeah. Um, and my dad, <laughs> from what I know, was a stagehand and a background actor on all my children wow and um my uncle worked with him there uncle timothy and they spotted my mom apparently both of them did they spotted my mom coming out i think as far as from what i was told going out to lunch they both spotted her they both were kind of attracted to her and between the both of them they were trying to figure out who was going to be the one to talk to her yeah um in the end it ended up becoming my father um, and he chased her for as far as I know the story goes for about six or seven months. Uh, my mom wasn't having it. She was kind of a snob when she was younger. Um, but somehow he wore her down. He might have pulled like some smooth Jamaican, hey, man, you're a beautiful woman line. And um, ended up uh, getting with her. And the thing is, my mom was very young at this point. She was 16. Um, they had come from the Dominican Republic. And my mom was apparently ridiculously smart to her. She graduated high school early and was able to get into this thing to do this type of career path. Wow. And um, she ended up getting pregnant young. Yeah. Um, and she pulled herself out of school, which was not something that the family was for, obviously. Sure, sure. Um, they didn't like my dad, obviously, because of what had happened. You know, typical family kind of stuff. Uh, and... Um, she ended up giving birth to me in the Bronx at uh, Lincoln Hospital. I was the first American born from both sides of the family. Wow. Since everybody else had been born either in Germany or the islands. Sure. Um, so it was kind of a big deal to them because obviously, you know, the first one born here, it, it was like a landmark thing within that time because a lot of immigrants were coming in. Um, so when you had a child that was born here, everybody kind of looked at that child, like almost like in the Lion King when they hold up, you know, Simba, um, the way that it was explained to me by a cousin, it was like, yeah, it was like they were holding you up like Simba and you were going to be like this golden child and all this stuff. Um, and it was a celebrated event. Apparently, um, as time went on, my mom and dad split, um, and I ended up actually going back to Dominican Republic. Oh, okay. with my, how old were you then? I think I want to say I was probably one to two years old. Okay, 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 I see. Um, I went back with my grandparents. Uh, my mom stayed here to continue her education. 
and they kind of worked it out because they didn't want me to be something that distracted from her stepping up and doing what she had to do. Sure. Um, so I went back to the Dominican Republic, um, and I've got vague memories. I remember the house that I grew up in, the street, um, going to the school. Um, where, where in the DR? Um, I cannot even remember the name, and I was just told this two weeks ago. This is what happens when you get old. <laughs> uh, you tend to forget things, but um, I just do remember, because this was a very long time ago, that we lived near a river of some kind. Okay, okay. And that the next door neighbor, this older lady who, um, you have people that when you're young, they you just remember them for being really amazing people to you. Yeah. And she was someone that took care of me because my grandmother was kind of like a nurse and my grandfather actually owned a club yeah. in Dominican Republic, a music oh, wow. club. Okay. Um, and they were constantly busy and I was at school. I had other family members there. Um, and I do remember uh, my grandfather having that club. And I do remember certain times growing up going to help him oh, wow. at this club. But what I would do is I would help the bands. Okay, like I would okay. help bring in whatever gear, cables, whatever it is that they had at that point. Um, and I remember it being a good time. Yeah. Um, it's all that I knew at that point because I don't remember anything prior to that. Because obviously, you know, when you're a kid, you, yeah, don't, sure. you don't remember much. Um, and then at some point, we ended up coming back here. We moved to the Bronx um, off of Marcy Avenue or Mercy, Mercy or Marcy Avenue. Okay. Um, and I remember some vague memories there because at that point, my mom and father had gotten back together. I see, I see. So I went and lived with them for a couple of years, and I do remember a lot of music being played in the house. Like, I was very, very young, but I remember the multitude of music that was played in my house daily, and it was everything. Disco, salsa, merengue, wow. uh, reggae, pop music at that time. Sure. Um, and just rock, and just like everything, and it came from both of them. Wow. Um, they both did have a huge love of music. My mom had a huge love of soul and R&B and stuff like that. My father was more of, he listened to differing styles of music. Sure. Um, and I do remember, um, we had like one of those old wicker chairs that people that grew up in the eighties, they'll remember these chairs. Yeah. And I remember sitting in the couch on the living room and one day, here, my dad put on a Bob Marley record, and uh, my mom was in the kitchen, and he was just singing uh, Bob Marley. My mom comes in, she sits on the wicker chair, and my dad comes in, he sits on it too, and he sits on her lap. And I just remember um, them just being there, and wow. then that moment enveloped in music. Wow. Because it felt like such a pure moment where. You know, it was almost like a movie almost. Like yeah. they were by the window, the sun was coming in, they were sitting there. I could feel their love between them. I could feel the love of music in the house. Um, and then the fat joint that my dad lit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, not long after that, they split. I'm not sure for what. Um, I was really young at that point. Yeah. Um, my mom went to go to try to try to get herself a more stable job. I went to live with my grandparents at this yeah. point again. Um, and then they moved to Elliott Avenue. Okay, okay. And there is where I spent a lot of my younger years that I remember growing up in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, How old were you? When? Uh, I oh, think wow. I was, I honestly got to say, I was around in the third grade. Okay, I see, I see. So age-wise, I don't remember a sure. lot from this point, but I do remember I was in the third grade because I went to this public school that was near the house. Yeah. Um, and I remember I was only there for a year because I do remember that it was, uh, there was an incident in, a, in the class where two kids got into a fight. Yeah. And one kid stabbed another kid with a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember coming home that day and I was all like, oh my God, mom, like this, that, and the third. And my grandmother was like, hey, whoa, 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 calm down, what happened? And I was like, hey, he got into a fight with him and he got into a fight with him and they were throwing fists and he picked up a pencil and he stabbed him. And my mom was like, whoa, 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 what? <laughs> and I was like all hocked up because, you know, I'm a kid and it was like the first time I'd seen stuff like this. Yeah. 
And she was like, no, no, no. We're going to put you in another school. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I take it back. Yeah, you know what I mean? But, you know, I mean, obviously your parents have the control over where you go to school. Sure. Um, and they ended up putting me in uh, Sacred Heart School okay. in Highbridge. I see, I see, I see. And if anybody knows Highbridge, that is where a couple of people that are famous now have uh, come from. Cardi B, she's uh-huh. from Highbridge. Uh-huh. Um, and a couple of other people, you know, here and there. And that is where I started school in the fourth grade. And that is where I can honestly say the pretext to my musical journey in a way began. Oh, really? Okay. Um, Because at that point, I remember in the Bronx at that point, everybody knows families during this time in the 80s, everybody was immersed. It was a community. Everybody was outside during the summer having fun. They had the pumps open. The kids uh-huh. were playing. The dads were playing dominoes. The moms were looking out of the windows, yelling at their kids. Um, and I remember I started to make friends at this point. I made friends with uh, a guy in my building named Bam Bam. Um, his mom used to sometimes sit for me. Um, and that is also where Frank lived from Fahrenheit 451. He lived on the other side of the building. Um His mom and my mom knew each other. Our parents knew each other because obviously first floor. His parents and he lived on the first floor just on the other side. I see, I see. And a lot of the families, again, they all knew each other. Sure. So they hung out. The moms went to church, played bingo. You know, the dads would be outside having the rum, Uh you know, talking, watching the kids play and all that. And um, the other person, too, was Armando. His mom and his family were also in the mix as well. They lived on Elliot. They just lived on the upper part of the block. Ah, I see, I see, I see. And um, Armando's mom and, and uh, if I remember right, Frank's mom knew each other very well. So that's how they got introduced. Like wow. there's, there's pictures that hopefully either Armando or Frank has of them at a birthday party when they were kids. They, wow. they don't bring you this picture, I will send it to you. <laughs> um, and they were both really young, like... We're talking like young, young. Um, and my introduction to them, because Armando, I'm sure, already told you about the bicycle incident. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, They'll probably tell it tomorrow. So why don't you tell your version? Um, my version, Mondo and Frank, um, is that every kid, when they're growing up, they want a bicycle. You know what I mean? Bicycle, skateboard, uh-huh. or back then, big wheels. And um, I had complained Throughout the year, I want a bicycle, I want a bicycle, I want a bicycle. So all the kids riding bicycles. So finally, uh, my grandfather says, okay, goes out and buys me a bicycle. Brand new, awesome. And he's sitting there putting it together, and I'm helping him putting it together. Because my dad also liked working on cars. He was a side street mechanic. So he loved putting things together, and I kind of enveloped that from him as well. Yeah. And, you know, we went outside, and he you know, made sure all the training wheels were good. And he was like, all right, go have fun. And he was like... Do not lose it. Bring it home. And I'm riding away going, yeah, 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 no problem. You know, rode up the block, rode down the block. I'm hanging with all the other kids. And I'm all, I'm like that kid that's like, yo, like I got this new bike and like whatever. And then at some point, I remember coming back in front of the building. And I think I was going to go home. And obviously, I was a young kid. And I was skinny. I was scrawny. Um. Frank at that point was obviously older and so was Armando. Yeah, yeah. And I remember, you know, that, hey, oh man, that's, that's a nice bike, Kev. Oh, where'd you get that bike? And I was like, oh, you know, like I said, I knew them yeah. vaguely at this sure, point. Sure, sure, sure. And I'm like, oh, my dad got it and I'm all proud and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, it was like Frank just goes, <laughs> get off my bike. And I'm like, wait, what? And then I remember him pushing me off the bike. And him and Armando, uh, they jumped on it, and then they took off. Oh, my God. And I just remember sitting there going, wait, what just happened? <laughs> and, like, I sat there in front of the building for a couple minutes. It started to get dark out. And at that point, like I said, moms would hang outside the window, and they would yell for their kids to come yeah, in. Sure, sure. And at some point, I think I heard my mom say, hey, Kevin, get in, you know. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> How the hell am I going to explain this? So I sat there for another five minutes thinking, okay, what can I possibly say? Because I knew my dad was going to flip out and lose his mind. I just got the bike that day. And I'm like, you know what? 
let's just go in and handle business. Go in, go upstairs, and the first thing my mom says, where's the bicycle? And like, I'm like, all right, this is the moment, you know what I mean? This is the moment. And I'm like, I was going to sit there and say, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, you know, I broke it or something. Like, yeah, I was sure, thinking sure. in my mind as a kid, like, as a kid, your mind is racing a million miles an hour to come up with something that you know you can get away with that's believable. Yep, yep, yep. And then finally, I just blurred out, oh, somebody took it. <laughs> and I was like, at first, I was like, oh, crap, because now I'm going to have to say who did it. Yep. Because, again, all the moms knew all the kids. Uh-huh. And she was like, who? And then I heard my dad on the other side goes, what do you mean somebody took it? And he comes into the room and he was like, you know, he comes up, what do you mean somebody took it? And he goes, like, you let them take it? <laughs> and I'm like, oh crap, this didn't go as well as I thought it did. Okay. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I, there was too many of them. And he was like, well, what do you mean there was too many? I was like, look, dad, there was more than one. <laughs> and he kind of stood back and he was like, all right, we're going to find your bike. And he's like, I'm going to talk to these kids' parents. And I'm like, oh, crap. Because as a kid, you know you don't rat anyone out. You don't play that game on the block. And I was like, oh, crap. And now, mind you, at this point, they hadn't asked me who. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I'm like, okay, I go to the room. My, my younger brother Chris is there. I start playing with Chris. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm waiting only for them to ask. I'm waiting. Miraculously, they didn't ask. Wow. They didn't ask. <laughs> So I go to bed that night, and as I'm falling asleep, I'm like, crap, I know tomorrow they're going to ask about this. Wake up the next day, get dressed, go to school, come back. Nothing. And I'm like, two things. Either one, they know who did it, and they haven't told me anything about it. Or two, they're waiting to see what I say. Yeah. So I go, hey, mom, I'm going to go outside and play. She goes, all right. Doesn't say anything else. Run out of the house. Sure enough, Frank and Mondo with my bike in front of the building. So I run down and I'm like halfway terrified and halfway angry because I just spent the night going through this roller coaster of fear and anger over what's going to happen. And there they are in front of the building. Yo, ha, 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 like messing around. And I'm like, these mother. And Frank is like, yo, here's your bike. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, just like that. Yep. And, like, I go up and I, like, I grab it. And I'm like, I remember looking at them going, no, wait. This is, like, way too easy. Yeah. I remember, like, kind of stepping away. You know, as a kid, you're, like, stepping away, viewing the situation. <laughs> They're both there. And um, Frank's sitting there with, like, the, uh, the little icy things that you could buy for, yeah, like, sure. a dollar or whatever. Messy and whatnot. <laughs> And there's Mondo just standing there. But Mondo just, like, had this look. Like, I guess he was waiting to see what my reaction was going to be. And I was like, I kind of just stepped away. And I was like, all right. I literally, like, picked up the bike and ran. <laughs> and ran it in. My mom was like, oh, what happened? And I was like, oh, like I, I, like, I found the bike. And she was like, wait, you found it? I was like, yeah, it was in front of the building. And my mom just kind of looked at me. She goes, okay, leave it there. And I'm like, yeah, I probably should leave it there. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go back out. She's like, no, keep your ass inside. <laughs> now, again, I get terrified because I'm like, oh, crap. What if she saw them on the bike yeah. and told them to give it back? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, crap, I'm so going to get it. <laughs> Dad comes home. He sees the bike and he goes, Kevin, you got the bike back. And I'm like, yeah, dad, I found it. And he was like, where'd you find it? I was like, oh, front of the building. And my dad looks at me. He goes, you fucking liar. Let me say this in Spanish. He's like, I know where we live. Nobody leaves a bike in front of the building. And, like, I guess he was going to ask me, like, more about it. And I guess at that point, he just kind of gave up on it. And, you know, everything, like, everything was cool after that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that was my first introduction to Armando and Frank. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, that was uh, it's kind of it's like an internal story. Some people know it, some people don't. But I guess now the world is gonna know. Yeah. The yeah, yes, yeah. Mondo and Frank, they were bullies as kids. They picked on me. And they took my bike. I told you I was gonna get y'all back. Um, uh, but you know, those are like my brothers. 
um, love them. It's something that between us, uh, it's one of those moments that you look back on as an adult and it's like a like a weird bonding moment. Yeah, sure, sure. You know what I mean? Because it, it is, like I said, a pretext Absolutely. to things later on in life. Absolutely. That I had this moment with them and then many years later, we're all in the same place again. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, like I said, I went to Sacred Heart fourth grade because my mom took me out of the third grade public school for that violin incident. Sure. And uh, I'll never forget it. I got put into Miss Lara, Filipino teacher's class. Okay, okay. And um, that first week I was trying to get used to it because it was a Catholic school and you got to wear the uniform. Yeah. I was used to not having to do that. And I was trying to make friends and um, there was one girl who, she was nice to me. Uh, Rachel Rodriguez, who is Caesar from District 9's sister. Ah, okay, okay. And, um, like I said, I didn't know anyone at this point, so, like, I asked around where she was, because I think we had spoken in class for a little bit. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, like, she seems cool. Maybe I could get to be friends with her and see, you know what I mean? Sure. About being friends with other people and meeting new people here. Um, Caesar, her brother, thought that I had a crush on her. Which didn't please him. And I remember coming out of the cafeteria and we used to have a trash can that held the door open that went into the schoolyard. And I remember coming out of it one day and someone out of nowhere just comes and pushes me and I fall into the trash oh, can. No. <laughs> and I kind of remember like, like looking up and it was Caesar and this other kid named Count D. Okay, okay, yeah. And I was like, what the, like, I, I, I got pissed, like, what the fuck? And I remember Caesar going, stay away from my sister, this, that, and the third. And I was like, wow, like, like I was trying to say, like, I'm not into her like that. Yeah, but like, sure, all right, sure, you know sure. what I mean? Like, I'm new, I'm not going to, you know, like, pick a fight with anybody. And then come to find out, me and him were in the same class, Miss Lyra's class. He was okay. in that class. And already there was that incident, so there was already, like, that tenseness between us. Yeah. And I don't remember how now, all these years later... Um, we ended up getting sat one in front of the other. Wow. Like, I think I might have been sitting in front of him or he might have been sitting in front of me. And if I remember correctly, we ended up being given a test. And somehow, I think we ended up cheating off of each other. <laughs> and that, if I'm correct on that one, that is what led to us becoming friends. That's wild. Wow. And, um... We ended up becoming uh, very tight because we both had similar personalities for a lot of things at that point yeah. in life. Um, like, basically, we became, like, brothers. Yeah. Really. Like, um, I hung out with him, like, every day. Like, we did stuff together. We hung out as kids. Where did he live? Did he, did he, he lived off of 164th and Sheridan Avenue. Oh, Off okay, of okay, the Grand okay. Concourse. I see, it's, like, I see. one block off of the Grand Concourse. I see. Um, and I remember at that point, that became... Like, my first best friend. Oh, okay, okay. Wow. Because we were together every day hanging out, getting into trouble. You know, the yeah. stuff the fourth graders do yeah, as kids, sure. you know what I mean? Um, doing dumb stuff to girls that we like, like the bra strap game, we run up behind them. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, you run off. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. And then getting older, uh, we started hanging out, like, after school and on weekends. And I remember one weekend I went to his house. First time ever. Yeah. And I didn't know, like, I knew, but I didn't know that Caesar loved the reptiles. I did, too. So it was one of those things that helped bond us. Yeah, sure. And he's like, yeah, I got a couple of snakes. And I was like, oh, I got a couple of lizards. But we never really spoke on it, like, deeply yeah. at that point. And then I remember going to his house, and he showed me that he had a boa constrictor. Uh, and I can't remember her name now. And this snake was not like a little boa constrictor. He kept her in their closet. Oh, my God. Because she was that massive. Wow. Huge. She had to have been at least five or six feet long. Wow. And he had another snake that was about the same length, a reticulated python, I want to say. Oh, okay, okay. Wow, okay. And um, his parents were, like, very open. I, I almost want to say that, like, looking back on it now, they were, like, the New York City Hispanic version of hippies from the 70s. Uh, I they see, were like I see, I really see, awesome, really cool, really loose. Um, into music as well. Yeah. 
Um, they just had a household that was very open and inviting. Sure. Um, and they pretty much allowed Caesar to have whatever pet he wanted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I thought that was like really awesome. Whereas in my house, I had to fight just to get the things that I had. Sure. <laughs> um, and we ended up uh, like hanging out all the time on weekends. Um, we would literally, I remember walking around Fordham Road. There used to be a pet store up there. We would walk from 164th and Sheridan to this pet store on the Grand Concourse with these huge pythons wrapped around us as kids. Wow. And we were like walking around with them like we were cool, you know what I mean? Oh and these God. things were not, and I'm like, I'm not kidding you. These things were like this in terms of girth. They're, they're heavy, right? Yeah. Yeah. But we did it. Wow. And we would walk around with them like we were cool. And his dad would walk with us and people would stop us and talk to us about it. <laughs> And, <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing! <laughs> um, and, and it was just crazy because this was in the South Bronx. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And um, this went on for years that we did this. Um, and at one point, I remember going to his house and seeing a Bon Jovi poster on his sister's wall. Huh. And. I want to say it might have been the slippery when wet or something like that. I can't remember. It was something that said that. Yeah. And I remember seeing it and I'm wondering what it was. And I thought that it was like really cool, like the design. Sure, sure. But I didn't think anything of it. And that summer, I went to California because I had an uncle who was in the Marines that lived out there. Okay, yeah. And every now and again, we would go visit her in the summer. And that summer, I went and um, I met a bunch of kids who were into skateboarding because yeah. he lived um, on what was called then Treasure Island. It's that small island when you look at the Golden Gate Bridge that you see kind of as part of it. Oh, it used see, to be a marine base. I don't know if it still is. Yeah. Um, and these kids were into skateboarding and punk. Uh-huh. Now, I never really heard punk. I heard it, but I didn't. Yeah, at sure. Time. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and I remember one of the kids, and ironically, his name was Steven. Oh, wow. wow. I just remember this kid because he, we were, like, we had skateboarded to a pier. And then we skateboarded back to where the housing was. And we went to his backyard, and there was a group of us, and we were all hanging out. And he's like, hey, I got this cassette tape of this, this band from New York City. And I was from New York, so I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, <years>. cool, Yeah. <laughs> And I was like, well, what are they called? And he's like, I don't know. Like, my older brother got it in some shit called Beastie Boys. <laughs> and I was like, now, granted, I'd never heard of them. Sure, sure. Never heard of them. Sure. He put this thing on, and I just remember going, wow. Like, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, got heavily into skateboarding and listening to other bands at that point that were from Cali. Sure. Uh, but I didn't really know because at that point I was still younger. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, um, I don't remember the names at this point in life. Came back to New York City after the summer was over. And then I remember me and Caesar were still, you know, close and hanging out and brothers. And I remember us watching Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I remember at the very ending of the movie, we kind of just looked at each other. And I think it was me or him. Like I think we might have almost even said it at the same time. Like, yo, we should play music. Yeah. And it was like something that hit us both. Wow. At that point. And, you know, at that point, then we wanted to get into music more. And then right around that time, we heard Guns N' Roses for the first time. Oh, I see. I see. That band was, for both of us, the catalyst sure. of everything. Sure. And I granted, yes, Gun N' Roses is like a hard rock band or whatever people want to call them. They weren't punk or New York hardcore. But sure. for us, they were the catalyst. Absolutely. Um, he was heavily influenced by Slash. Yeah. Like, yeah. his playing is deeply and heavily influenced by Slash. Obviously, I got into Duff McKagan as a bass player. But at that point... You know, we were still trying to fathom instruments. Sure, sure. And that is when we went to Bronin's Music. Bronin's Music. Here in the Bronx. Sure. You know? um, and I believe my aunt, and I want to say his dad, we met there. Oh, I 
see. Like we both met there that day because we said we wanted to buy instruments. Yeah. So my aunt uh, took me there and his dad took him and we went there and he got a guitar and uh, I got a white Fender P bass. Okay, okay. And uh, it was a funny day because my aunt was flirting with one of the sales guys, this guy named Rocky that used to uh, work there. Like She was like heavily flirting. And Rocky was like this big muscle tattoo kind of biker dude. Um, and she was like openly flirting with him, like, like leaning on the, on the table. And, and I knew, and I was just like, oh my God, my aunt is embarrassing me. She was just supposed to bring me here to like get me a bass and she's like embarrassing me. Um, and then that was the day that we also met Loki. Aha. Uh-huh. Because Loki worked there at that point. We met him, and I think he sat down with Caesar for a couple minutes to show him stuff about his guitar. Sure. Uh, then he came over to me. He sat down with me. He's like, you plug this in here. You plug that in there. This is an amp. This is your strings. Yeah. EADG. And mind you, I'm a young kid, and all of this is hitting me at once, and I'm like, oh, my God, like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah, I did yeah, not yeah. think there was going to be this much stuff involved. Yeah, for Because sure. I'm still thinking Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> they just plugged they in. It and it was so easy. <laughs> yeah, like they plugged in, and it was like, Wah! and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. And um, he was like, you guys are just going to end up coming back, so I'll sit down with you then yeah okay cool so we took our instruments home i bought an amp a little pv 10 inch amp and i think caesar bought an amp that day you know obviously he took his stuff home and i took my stuff yeah yeah and i think like a week later i came over to hang out and i was just like i remember us talking about it and i was like yo where's your guitar yeah and he's like oh i broke a string (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, oh, like, you know, okay, cool. Because, you know, obviously you know about stuff like that. And I'm yeah, like, sure. okay, cool. Like, and then I was like, yo, like, let's go to Bronin's and get another string. And he was like, I don't know if I can. And I was like, why? He's like, because I guess he thought that he broke the guitar at that point. Because oh, he broke a string. I see, I see. So the yeah, guitar yeah, yeah. itself was broken. Yeah, sure. Obviously we didn't know. And, um, like, we ended up going and to Bronin's. And Loki was there that day. And Loki remembered us. Yeah. Um, because we were like these two Hispanic kind of punk rock looking kids at that point. Yeah. Because we were heavily into Guns N' Roses. Uh, we started to get into Metallica at this sure. point. Um, and I remember, I think I might have had a Metallica t-shirt and I had like a black hat that had like a Guns N' Roses bandana that went around it. Yeah, yeah. Caesar started to grow his hair out a little bit. Um, like he had, he had like two earrings, I think, on one ear. Like I had one. And like I guess he just remembered us. Yeah. And we walked in and, you know, um, the guy that used to own the store was this guy named Sid who took a liking to me and Caesar. Sure. And, you know, we walked in, we said hi to him. We walked in, Loki was there, you know, obviously started looking at other instruments. Like people do when they go to music stores, they yeah. look at other instruments, they take the sound, they play it. And I remember again, Caesar went in to plug something. I went in to plug something. Loki went in to talk to him about something. He comes over to me and I'm just sitting there messing around and he goes, did you learn anything from the last time we spoke? And I was like, no. <laughs> and he was like, okay, this is, this is the one lesson I'm going to give you. And this is all you're going to need to know. And I was like, okay. So he takes the bass that I had in my hand, which was a BC rich bass. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, uh, cause I thought it was like the most metal looking bass <laughs> yeah, ever. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, Oh sure. man, this is awesome. And I'm like, damn, I wish I would've got this bass. <laughs> <laughs> and He's like, okay, these are your four strings. And he goes, E-A-D-G. And I was like, hey, I remember that part. And he goes, good. Every asshole does good. Just remember that. And I was like, wow, that is so cool. (laughs) And, um, you know, that he played around with it a little bit. And, like, I knew that he played bass, but I'd never seen him. Because the first time we came in, he told me, he's like, oh, I played bass too. And that's why he told me E-A-D-G. Yeah. And I just remember he just sat there. And mind you, Loki had like the long hair. He had like the classic metal guy look. And I'm like, man, he is so fucking cool. (laughs) And he's just sitting there just freaking going off, throwing lines and all this stuff. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. And then, um, you know, obviously we went home. And then like I came over again. And um, at that point, like I said, we were still learning how to play our instruments. Sure, sure. And we weren't being taught musically. We were literally just sitting there 
messing and around. playing. Like, yeah. Like, we learned Guns N' Roses songs. Wow. Uh, we learned the Black Album from Metallica. Not all sure. the songs, but sure. just the popular ones, you know, like Enter Sandman, yeah. and like all the hits and all that. Um, and then at that point, we were like, yo, like, we got to start a band. Yeah. And there was another friend of ours who lived in the building, this kid named Pierre, who was a Puerto Rican kid, real awesome dude. And he wanted to play drums. Okay, okay, perfect. But he couldn't afford drums. And obviously sure. you can't stick a drum set in a New York City apartment. Sure. So he took some pails, some garbage pails. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he brought them in, and he went and got a set of drumsticks. So I brought over my little bass amp and my bass, and Caesar had his little thing. And we sat there in his parents' bedroom. Yeah. And literally just started playing and jamming and having fun. Wow. Um, and I remember, obviously, a couple of times his parents were like, hey, turn it down. <laughs> Um, neighbors above banging. <laughs> well, that's the thing. The neighbors, at least as far as I knew, unless they complained to his parents. Yeah. Um, we the only times I remember his parents coming in were just when we were just losing it and just going off. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, but it was a moment. Yeah. For us, because I think in both of our heads, even though we played instruments, we never thought of the concept of bands. Absolutely. Other than Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and then I guess at that point it hit us about doing bands, like doing something with that. Um, Pierre, uh, at that point we were in high school. We both graduated eighth grade. Yeah. He went to Cardinal Hayes High School. I see, I see. I ended up going to Ohalo's High School. And the only reason I went there was because we got out at like 1.30 in the afternoon. Oh, I see, at that I see. Point. I mean, we started school, I think, at like 7 a.m. on the dot. Wow. But I think they released us at 1.30. And for me, that was like, well, hell yeah, I want to get released. early Because then I can like hang out and do like whatever I wanted. Absolutely. And at that point, I was going home and just picking up the instrument and playing. Yeah. Um, and we, at that point... I ended up, because you're in Catholic school, we were both still in Catholic schools, part of the thing for graduating was you had to go volunteer to do something. Oh, okay, okay. I volunteered at this place called Grace House, which was like a youth biblical kind of thing where yeah. you did like retreats on weekends with other kids your age and okay. like you did biblical stuff and all that. And we met this girl there named Cleo, who was a, she was wanted to become an actress. Yeah. And she was involved in a place downtown near 14th Street where they put on plays. And so she had a couple of little connects. And she had got offered to go do poetry at the Barnes & Nobles on the west side. I think it's still there. On 84th or somewhere around there, right? I think it's somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. And it was like a seminar thing for young okay. and up-and-coming artists. Okay. So she asked me and Caesar to go play. Yeah. And we were like, cool. Mind you, we still hadn't written a song yet. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Nothing. We were just still having fun amongst ourselves. We literally walked into Barnes and Nobles and just looked at each other. And we just started playing a song. Like, I remember starting the bass line and Caesar joined in. Wow. Because at that point, we only knew each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Musically sure. at that point. Um, and a song came from that. And the girl Cleo kind of jumped in on it. And mind you, it was just him, me, and then the girl. And people dug it. Wow. And mind you, we are still in our very early teens. Wow, like 14. Yeah. Something like that, right? You got the 15, 15 at that. Okay. I want to say 15. Wow. And you had people in Barnes & Noble stopping to look at us and, like, get into it. And um, at the end, the guy that put the seminar together asked us to come back and do it again. Wow. And we were like, wow, this is, like, so cool. And mind you, it wasn't punk. It yep. wasn't hardcore. Um, looking back, I hear the song in my head. I want to say it was, like, pop. Sure, sure. Because at that point, we were still learning. Absolutely. Um, all I knew was EADG, every asshole does good. And that's uh -huh. what Caesar knew for guitar. We didn't know what notes were. and no, we, Like, we didn't learn that way. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so the guy asked us to come back. And we were like, oh, yeah, cool. Like, we'll do it. Um, I mean, we never went back at that point. Because, you know, we started getting older. And, yeah. you know, things happened. But I think that that was something that for both of us 
hit us as well. Sure. Because it was our first introduction into playing the show. Yeah. So we started going back to jamming amongst us, and then uh, this guy named Rich, or Reach as we call him, he came into the picture. Now, Reach was, at that point, somebody that knew how to play guitar very well. Okay, okay. And he was somebody that could sing, but more like a metal yeah. kind of thing. I see. And he started hanging out with us, and then the three of us started jamming in his uh, mom's bedroom. And we actually came up with three or four songs. I can't remember what the song titles were, um, but we came up with three or four songs at that point. And it was really fun Yeah. at that point. Um, around that same time, I moved from the Bronx where we lived because we had moved from Elliott to Anderson Avenue. Oh, I see. Which is near Yankee Stadium. I see. And then we moved from there to University Avenue. Sure. Bronx. Sure. At that point, while all that was happening in high school, we moved from the Bronx to Harlem and Manhattan. I see. I see. Um, at that point, it was my grandparents were taking care of myself, yeah. my brother, and my two sisters because okay. uh, family craziness would just say. Sure, sure. Um, so the, obviously a bigger place was needed. Yeah. So we moved to Harlem on 108th and Central Park West, which people now go, oh, man, that's the rich guy's neighborhood. That's like <laughs> not, friends. Not at the time. Dude, <laughs> back at that point, no. That was still ghetto Harlem. That was like, I remember moving in and there was like, like, like you could tell, yeah, this was some ghetto stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, we moved there and, um, at that point, since I was removed from the Bronx, um, obviously it was upsetting because all of my friends were there. You know what I mean? Like my life was built around everything in the Bronx. I was still going to school there. All of my friends were there. The little thing that I was building was there. So I had to start traveling now from there to the Bronx. And during this point, if anybody remembers, in the early to mid-90s, New York City was not what it is. You know what I mean? It's becoming a bit crazy now, but back then, it was way crazy. And um, But I didn't care. Sure, sure. Because as a teenager, you do things and you don't, you know what I mean? Like, there's things you don't care or think about. That's right, yeah. And I started traveling back and forth. And there was, like, a lot happening at this point in life. Yeah. You know, I was about to graduate high school. Um, I was still involved in the Grace House thing. Um, Caesar, at this point, had gotten more deeply involved with Loki and Mike from District 9. Ah, I see. I through see, I Loki. See. I see. And during that time, they had a band called Close Call. Close Call, for sure. And um, I remember Caesar calling me one day and going, yo, like, I'm going to go hang out with Loki and Mike. They got this band called Close Call. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like, like, where are they playing? And he was like, no, they're at the studio. Come. Yeah. And I was like, well, hell yeah, because I still remembered Loki. Sure, sure. So I came down, we watched them play, and I remember us just looking at each other and, like, hearing this band and this rhythm and this punch and this drive from that band and the way that they played, the way that they came across, it was like a confidence, yeah, like a certain confidence in these guys. Um, And I remember it was very infectious because we immediately became fans at that point Um, to where we started going with them to the studio. We became like, helpers. Sure, sure. Like, I remember going in a couple times, I was setting up Loki's bass and, like, trying to tune it, and you know what I mean? Yeah, and Caesar yeah. was helping out and all that. And that summer, somehow, we went to a show at Bond Street. Okay. And, um, somehow, I don't remember now, we ended up actually working at Bond Street as barbacks. Wow, okay. And we were ridiculously young at this yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, granted, prior to that, we had been to a couple of hardcore shows in the Bronx. Uh, there was the, I want to say the Rumble in the Bronx or something like that. Oh, at Grand a church, Street. right? Yes. Yes. 
Um, is that we near Cortona to, Park, Easter? I forget. Someone, I forget if Lenny told me. Someone, yeah. someone remembered where it was. Yeah, well, Lenny remembers. Remember. Lenny's like a historian yeah. for a lot yeah. of this stuff. But we went to that show. We had seen the band Rampage, who we knew Joey Rampage, because Joey also worked at Browning's. Sure, sure. Um, and a couple of other bands. And I want to say Close Call played that day, but don't quote me on I it. Think, I think I remember Lenny I think they. Too. I think that they did play. Yeah. Um, and then again, like I said, at that same time, Bond Street came up. We started working there as, bar, as barbacks yeah. for Nikki Camp. Okay. And we were ridiculously young, where if you did that now, yeah, you'd lose that license real uh, quick. Absolutely. <laughs> but I do remember that there was a show that happened. VOD, without a cause, I want to see the Iceman. Okay. And another band happened that night. Yeah. And I remember I was bar backing, which, you know, at that point for us, because we were really young, we were just literally grabbing ice, giving it to the bartender, sure. and just helping them out with whatever they needed. And I remember going out and seeing these bands play and just like, wow. Like, wow. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I felt like, like a weird sense of like, this is just so freaking cool. Yeah. And, you know, went back to work. And I just remember going home that night. I mean, she's like, we, like we used to go home at like 2 a.m. in the morning in yeah. New York City sure. at that time on the train on our own <laughs> with like pocketfuls of cash because Nikki would pay you in cash. And I remember being a young kid. And then like that morning when I got like when I, when I woke up, I remember my grandmother saying like, you know, like I had told her that I got this job. Yeah. And she was semi OK with it. And she was like, oh, did they pay you? Like, you know, like, it was like she was looking for something to say negative about it. Sure. And I was like, yeah, they did. Like, I ran in the room. Like, I came back with, like, this small knot of money. Yeah. And she just looked at me like, wait a minute. Where'd you get that? And I'm like, he paid us in cash. <laughs> and then, um, and I, I remember giving my mom money for stuff around the house. Because I felt like I had to consider. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Um. And I think I worked there for maybe another couple of weeks. Caesar worked there a bit longer. Um, but our introduction to the hardcore scene was that whole frame there, which was wow. over a year period, I want to say, give yeah. or take. Um, at some point, I got more deeply involved with the Grace House thing that I was doing. Caesar kind of, like we kind of split in a way at I that see. time. Because uh, we both were very close to graduating high school. Yeah. Um, he got more involved with Close Call and helping them out. Um, I got more involved with that. Like, we were both still playing. Sure. But our lives kind of started to diverge a little bit. Um, like, we still spoke all the time. We still hung out. But, like, where what we did started to branch out a bit. Yeah. And I think at some point he auditioned for Close Call. Oh, okay. And... Um, they loved him. Yeah. They loved him. Because Caesar, obviously, he is, um, honestly, I got to say, he's probably one of the most, if not the most, talented guitar player that I have met. Sure. His feel for blues and rhythm and soloing um, is just deep. Yeah. Um, so he ended up getting with them. And um, I was just like, wow, like, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. And um, at one point, he called me up and he said, hey, like, do you want to try out for a band? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, wait, wait, like what band? Yeah. And he was like, oh, it's the band without a cause. And I was like, okay, cool. Because I did remember them. From Bond Street, right? Right. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, cool. I was like, well, you know, I got to hear the music, obviously. So he's like, yo, like, I'll meet up with you this weekend and I'll bring it to you. And that weekend, I remember I was having a weekend retreat at Grace House. Yeah. And I was like, yo, just, just meet me there and bring me the tape. Yeah. We meet up, gives me the tape, you know, we speak for a couple minutes on it, and he gave me, he was like, he let me know that he was going to give them my number for them to call me sure. to set up an audition. So I went home that Sunday, um, and I started learning the songs. Yeah. It was two songs, if I remember correctly. Um, Fragments, and I want to say No More Promises. Oh, okay, okay. I want to say it was that song. Um, so I went home, I learned them as the best that I could. Yeah. Um, 
And I think Lenny called me at that point to set up the audition, which was downtown. Sure. Um, and I was like, yeah, we set it up. And I remember speaking to Caesar at this point. I was like, dude, like, I'm so nervous. I'm excited. I'm nervous. Because, like, I was just this kid that saw all these other people play and saw them play as a fan. Yeah. Now I'm trying out for this band. Yeah. So this is a different thing now. Um, and at that point, I was into metal and into alternative. Because during this time, the alternative scene kind of came in or grunge sure. and crushed hair metal and metal to a point. Uh -huh. Like all of this was happening at once at this point during our lives. Sure. Um, and I'm not afraid to say it. I was into hair metal. I was into Motley Crue, uh -huh. Bon Jovi. I did have a poison cassette. And I don't care what anyone says. I did have it. Um, uh, Cinderella, sure. Wasp, uh, and just like so many other bands. But, I wasn't like a hair metal guy that looked that way, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what entranced me was the concept of bands making music. Sure. And the emotions that it brought. That's what really caught me. Yeah. Um, and then I remember hearing Nirvana for the first time. It was Headbangers Ball after midnight. I was literally sitting there in my room just watching it. And that song comes on and I was like, wow. This was really freaking awesome. Yeah. And then I remember hearing a deeply influential band to me, Alice in Chains. Oh, uh, okay, okay, sure. I heard Man in a Box, and I'm not going to lie, I was as hell. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I just remember hearing that song, and it was just like, I felt it deeply. Yeah. In a way that I hadn't felt the band's music since Guns N' Roses. Wow, wow. Um, I remember going out, and at that point it was cassettes sure. and CDs. And I remember going out and buying um, facelift, yeah, and getting home. And as I was coming home from um, the Wiz, that used to be the music store back in the day that everybody went to, um, that was on Ninety Sixth Street and Broadway. I would walk to the Wiz and then walk home. Yeah, hearing facelift, and the music just hit me in a way that was. Very emotional. Sure. Because that first record, um, it is a deeply emotional record for those guys. Um, but it hit me in a very, again, in a deep way. And um, I remember hearing Mike Starrs playing on that, and I was just floored by it. Mm -hmm. Because he felt what he was playing. Yeah. Versus a lot of people that you just don't see them. And they play just to get it out there. Yeah, sure, sure. That, to me, was the first band that felt every single note that they played emotionally. Yeah. Because you know, like, and I'm sure other people know, you can hear a band for the first time and you can feel the music. Like Absolutely. You can feel it. Versus another band where you're like, wow, that sounds cool. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? The it doesn't hit there. you. Yep. To me, they were the band that hit me. Um, and it was deeply Mike Starr and Lane Stanley that hit me. His lyrical content, the way he sung, and how Mike's bass playing, to me, was an anchor for that first record. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I was just floored by it. But I was also still a metalhead. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So when I went in to try out for these guys... Um, I was like on the way there, and I remember I was taking the C train. Yeah. And I was sitting there thinking, how the hell? Like I knew the music, but how do I approach it? Sure. And I just said, fuck it. Whatever yeah. happens, happens. I yeah. go in, everybody greets me. But then I remember as soon as I walk in, as soon as I walk in, I see Frank and Mondo, and I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. What the. And I remember Lenny coming up to me. Hey, what's up, Kevin? Blah, 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 blah. And he was, like, being really nice. Yeah. And um, I, the entire, like, Lenny's talking to me. And I'm looking at them, and I'm like, these mother. <laughs> and I remember Frank walks over to me. And obviously, we all still kind of knew each other. Yeah, sure, sure. And Frank was like, yo, like, what's up? Like, I can't believe it. Like, we're all in the same room and blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, yeah, motherfucker, we're in the same room. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we in the same room. Man. And I'm bigger now than I was. Then. Yeah, you know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get y'all now. I'm going to get y'all now. <laughs> um, and I remember I played the songs. And then at that point, like, they threw some other stuff at me and I jammed with them. And for me, it felt very good. I felt like this was something that I could do. But I didn't know how they felt. Sure. Because they were very reserved in a way. Because they had already tried someone else out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we all left at the ending of the night. You know, Frank and Mondo, you know, we spoke for a little bit because obviously we knew each other from way back. Yeah. And I remember I did bring up, like, yeah, I still remember y'all on fucking still on my bike. <laughs> yeah, I still remember. And they laughed about it. They were like, oh, man, you still remember that? Ha, ha, ha. And I'm sitting there thinking, I ain't fucking laughing. <laughs> Do you see me laughing? <laughs> but all right, cool. <laughs> and um, I think, like, I went home. I didn't speak to any of them for a couple of days. And then Caesar called me up. He's like, yo, like, how did it go? This, that, and the third. And I'm like, well, I think it went good, but I haven't heard from him. Yeah. And at that point, he was officially a member of Close Call. So he's like, dude, like, I hope you get it. You know, we can play out together. And I'm like, dude, like, I hope I get it too. And then Lenny called me a couple days later. And he was like, hey, you know, like, we like you. You're in this, that, and the third. And then I'll never forget it. Well, are you going to fucking show up for practice now? <laughs> And I just remember going, wow, like, okay, because, like, I mean, <laughs> it's just how Lenny is with certain things. Like, yeah. he comes at you a certain way. And it was, like, my first real one-on-one uh, -on -one with Lenny. Yeah. And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking after we hung up, like, wow, man, all right, this is going to be a ride. <laughs> and then – um I get to practice. They start throwing the stuff at me, and I'm learning it, trying to get it, trying to get in there. Um, and the entire time, because I am the new guy yeah. and the young guy, obviously the hazing and uh -huh. everything else comes into play. And uh, at that point, like I said, I was still doing the church thing. But mind you, at this point in my life, I am getting into music in this way. Yeah, and sure. those two things at that point in my life didn't meet. Yeah. So I got away from that and I started hanging out with Frank and Caesar. Funny story now. I go to meet up with them at the Mermaids in the Bronx. It's the park that is across the street from All Hallows High School and from the Bronx County Courthouse. Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. And they used to hang out there and puff their herbs back in the day. Yep. So I go to hang out with them and I, they're like, yo, you know, they're like rolling up, like, yo, hit this. And I'm like, nah, man, I'm like naturally high. I don't need that <laughs> stuff. I'm like, I'm cool, I'm energetic, I don't need that. And a couple times I hung out, and then one time I said, fuck it. Because they kept they kept coming at me about it. So I said, you know what, fuck it. I was like, I'm going to try it. You see, it's not, nothing's going to happen to me. And I remember us three sitting there, and then Caesar passed it to me, and I hit it. And I started coughing and all this. <laughs> they're like laughing, you know what I mean? Because they, they already knew what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> next thing I know, I hit it again, and finally I got it right. And right away, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Five seconds later, I just remember going, whoa. <laughs> like, everything was just, like, this really crazy sensation. And, like, I gave it back to him. We hung out for a bit, and then it hit me. Yeah. Fuck, I gotta go home. <laughs> and I'm like... <sighs> I'm, like, getting paranoid, because my grandma was, like, the old-school Catholic mom. Um, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to stink. I'm going to stink. And Caesar and Frank are laughing at this point because I'm paranoidly freaking out in the middle of the park about this. I go to the grocery store that's right there and I buy a pack of Wrigley's gum. And they used to be like 25 cents and I think it was like five or six in a pack or something. And they were with me because they're like, yo, we're going to walk you to the train, dude. <laughs> and I walked in the store and I bought this gum and like I undid all of them and just shoved it in my mouth and I started chewing it and I had this big lump of gum here and these guys are like laughing at me and I'm paranoid as hell because I think I stink which I probably did and I'm high yeah, yeah. and I remember riding the train home thinking oh my god she's gonna kill me and like I get home it was late they were asleep so like I get into the house open the door and my bedroom was the first one as soon as you came in yeah so I go in, and, like, nobody's awake. Like, I run into my room, close the door. I spit the gum out of my window. Mind you, I had been chewing this gum from 161st Street 
all the way to 108th Street in Manhattan uh-huh. <laughs> because I was so paranoid and so terrified. <laughs> the next day I woke up and at that point my mom knew that I was hanging out with Frank and she did remember Frank. Yeah, yeah. She's like, oh, how's Francisco? And this, I was like, oh, no, we're cool. And she's like, hey, how's he? like, oh, we're cool. And she's like, you know, then I told her that now I am officially in the band. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, hey, you know, like, I'm going to be working and in the band and going to college at this point. And um, she was like, okay, you know, this, that, and the third. And at that point, we started to heavily practice and rehearse. Sure. Um, and we ended up having our first show at the spot called The Pyramid. Oh, okay, okay. And I remember being ridiculously paranoid because yeah. I went from being the kid that saw these guys play to now auditioning, being in, and playing. Yeah. And I remember um, I was so paranoid that a buddy of mine from school came with me to the show. Like I had my, I remember I had to bring my bass, they had a head there, and I had to bring my cables to plug in. Sure. I forgot my cables. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, where was the pyramid located, do you remember? Uh, I, honestly, I, I remember it being somewhere in the village, but I cannot okay, remember okay, off okay. the top of my head. Yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. Um, I'll send you a flyer, because yeah. I do have the flyer at home somewhere. Oh, okay. okay saved sure. in an album that I have at home. Um, but I remember somebody loaned me a cable or something, and I played the show. Now, I don't remember the show itself because it was like such a blurred experience. Yeah, that, that. Um, but everybody said that it was good. Yeah. So I was happy. And at that point, um, there was a drumming change. We got a guy named Joel. And at that point, I had started to come into my own, slowly started to come into my own as a bass player. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and we were playing out a bit more. Um, and I was getting into other hardcore bands because, like I said, I came from a more grunge alternative rock kind of thing. Absolutely, yeah. And I was new of a couple of hardcore bands, but sure. I wasn't into them this way. Sure, sure, sure. And I remember going to a show and Lenny played the Orange Nine record, the very first one. Uh... And I remember hearing that and we were in a van and just feeling like, holy crap. Yep. This is just amazing. It's an amazing album, yeah. And obviously as a bass player, I remember hearing Davide, who was the bass player for that album, his tone, his sound, his attack, and just being blown away yeah. by this guy who I'd never heard of. And um, I remember like asking these guys, like, oh my God, who are these guys? And then Frank... Uh, I think he was driving the van, you know, then he said, oh, these guys were in a band called Burn, Chaka was the singer, you know, he ran off and did his own thing, he got a couple new guys, and I was like, okay, cool, and I was like, I really dug this record. Yeah, yeah. And we went and played the show that night, and then going home, we played the Orange Nine thing again. Uh-huh. Like, I remember this record when it dropped, every show that we had, I remember this being played at some point during the drive. Wow. Like, it was a very influential record in the very early point of the band. Yeah, yeah. And at some point, we decided to have the name change because we were still under the lot of calls at sure. this point. Um, and obviously, with the change of me, the new drummer, the new singer, um, the band was playing differently. Sure. There was, an, uh, I guess, an evolution, if you want to call it that. Um, and, you know, we fiddled around with names for a bit. And then the name, I think Armando was the one who came up with Fahrenheit for 51. I see. And everyone just kind of looked around and we were like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Like, that's it. And we ended up at that point saying, well, we've got to write new music because we were still playing a lot of the without a cost set. Sure. So there was stuff that was being filtered around in the band musically at that point, which ended up becoming Shift and Settle. Uh, okay. And those songs got recorded... But before I joined, the New York's Hardest Comp was put together. That's right, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that came out, I want to say, after the demo did. That's right, yeah. If Lenny, I, if, if I remember that. correctly. Yeah, okay, I said that too, yeah. Because if I get it wrong, I know Lenny's going to call me and text me like, yo, <laughs> how could you get that wrong, Kevin? You were there, dude. <laughs> um, Lenny loves his history. Yeah. And making sure that chronologically things are right. Um and at that point, 
being the new guy, I didn't know a lot of people in the scene. Sure. So I was more the observer of sure. everything. Um, and I think at that point, when the New York's Hardest Comp came out, shows around that started to pop up. Uh -huh. And at that point, the band got put on some shows for that. And all the older without a cause stuff, and then the two songs from the comp, everyone knew. Yeah. So people would lose their minds during those songs. Yeah. But then when Settle and Shift came on, it was like people didn't know how to react. Sure, sure. To those, like the newer stuff. And I think that that was something that hit us in a weird way. Yeah. Because we wanted to play out more. But the scene, the people booking shows, and then the fans didn't know how to take us. Because the band went from one thing in a short amount of time to something else. Yeah, because definitely. we all brought differing influences that weren't hardcore, purely, or That's metal. Right. That's right. Like, I'm coming in from the musical taste that I did. Frank had his thing. Mondo had more of a hip hop vibe yeah. where he was into metal, but he also had a hip hop thing to him. Absolutely. Um, whereas Lenny was, out of all of us, I can say he was the more traditional hardcore guy. Sure. He had a broad musical like, but he was more like he knew more about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people didn't know how to take us. Sure. So we didn't get booked a lot. Um, but when we did get booked, um, we made the most of it. Because we knew we had to. Sure. And I think that really bonded us individually to each other on a deep level. Because we almost kind of felt like it was us against the world. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Because um, we felt like musically we could play. And that we could go to these shows and play and have fun. And put what we were doing out there to people. Now, whether or not they liked it, like any band you know, or any product that... Any put anybody puts out. Yeah, sure. You put it out there, and if people like it, cool. If they don't, it kind of is what it is. That's right. Yep. You know what I mean? Uh, but it seemed like people just were, again, not knowing how to take us as a band. Yeah. And we weren't the typical hardcore guys. That's either, right. That's because right. Because a lot of those guys had come up in the scene, had family in the scene, um, whereas we were a mixed band. Whereas Lenny had his foot in the scene. Sure. From without a cause and doing everyone that he knew, Frank did as well. Yeah. Um, I didn't. Sure. Mondo kind of did because he did go to shows, but he was also coming in new. Yeah. Um, the drummer, Joel, at that point, same thing with him. Um, but we weren't, how to say this, we weren't like the typical metal, tough guy, hardcore guys. That's right. We weren't. That's right. You know what I mean? We were more this party, fun, let's go out there and play and have fun type of band. Yeah. Um, on top of the fact that we were the we were known as the guys that brought the herbs. Sure, 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 sure. That was a thing, that we were that band. And yeah. obviously, um, Jimmy from Murphy's Law was also down. Right. So everybody knew Jimmy for that as well. That's right. And other guys in other bands did it. Sure. Um, but we... I am going to brag about this one. <laughs> we brought that to a whole other level. Yeah. Um, to where you knew Fahrenheit was in the building when you smelled it. <laughs> because it was like one after the other, after the other, after the other. Like we would wake up, bake, yep. drive to get our gear or go to get our gear. And while getting there, bake, packing the gear, bake, get into the vehicle and go, bake, get to the club, unload, Bake. Go hang out downstairs. Bake. It was like um, we were bringing that whole thing to like a whole other level. Like we were known for that. Absolutely. Um, like there's a picture of Jimmy Williams downstairs with me at a club somewhere. And I think we might have been on tour um, with them. And I'm sitting there at the table and I'm rolling one up. And... Again, we had that reputation. Yep. And the picture, I'm going to send it to you. But you see Jimmy just looking at the camera and kind of looking at me like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's just this look of utter shock on his face. And I'm there. <laughs> in this picture. Um, and at that point, people started to 
realize who we were as a band, I guess. Sure. That we weren't a typical hardcore band, because you can go out and listen to the music. That's right. Um, but we did have hardcore elements. Sure. Because we did come from the scene. There were bands that we listened to that were hardcore. Um, you know, bands like Crown of Thorns, Madball, like yeah. Gnostic Front, Sick of It All. Sure. Um, Burn, Orange Nine, Fagazi, Minor Threat, Black Flag, Leeway, um, and a host of other bands. Sure, sure. Um, we all listened to those bands and we all took things from those bands that influenced us. So you could hear parts of those things in the music, but for us, there were other things we were bringing in. That's right. Um, I looked at it like I wasn't as good as the other bass players that were out there. Um, because I look at people like Craig, Davide, um, um, Adam from H2O, who I'm going to tell you something funny about him. Later. Oh, good, good, good. Um, and the other guys that were playing bass at that point, Sergio. Sergio. Um, and I'm like, well, these guys are just like on a whole other level. They're each bringing something to the instrument, to the music that I could not do. So I built myself as a bass player that concentrated on rhythm. Yeah. Purely rhythm, but feel. Sure, sure. Um, because I remember growing up, when I would hear bass, it would hit me how in salsa and merengue, uh -huh. the bass, it's very rhythmic. It is, yeah. In reggae, it's very rhythmic. Absolutely. Um, and again, Addison changed to me, the bass on that first record, it is so rhythmic. So I was like, okay, I can't do this like this guy. This guy's just amazing. I'm never going to be that guy. Yeah. But I can bring this to the table. Sure. So that was where I felt like my foothold in things was. So yeah. I concentrated on that. Um, and bit by bit, I became, I'm just going to say, decent. And then more people started to recognize us. More people started to get into us at this point. Um, we got put on bigger bills. Yeah. Um, we got to play here in the Bronx. We're sick of it all. At Milani at State Malali. Park. Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> um, that was such an amazing show. Yeah, because at that point we were so used to playing in the city and outside of the city that playing there was like a homecoming. Absolutely for us. You know what and, I mean? And close, very close to where at least three of y'all grew up. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, Lenny of all people would hang out in the Bronx a lot. Whenever yeah. we were at the Mermaids, Lenny would come and hang out. Lenny would come and hang out with us at Caesar's uh, spot when we were there hanging out. Um, but it felt like home. Yeah, yeah. It really did feel like home. And um, we played that show. Like, I, I couldn't even believe, first of all, being the kid that I was, that we were on a bill with Sick of It All. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Because for me, that was like, Holy crap, I get to share a stage with Craig. I'm sick of it all. Uh, I'm sick of it all, obviously. Yeah. So I was just like, Poof. and I remember one of the guys, I think Pete, had some kind of surgery. That's right, yeah. Letting and yeah. Um, they, we ended up getting swapped. And I remember thinking that that was so weird. And um, they played an amazing set, like. I just remember being off to the side of the stage, and there's, in the video of it, if you see it, it, it is out there, you see where I'm off to the side of Craig, and at one point, I'm standing behind his amp. Nobody recognizes me because I had hair, um, and I had a bit of a stash, and I was ridiculously skinny, but I am there, and I just remember hearing this band and going, wow, like, yeah. holy crap, there is power and rhythm and just something about this band yeah and then i remember being terrified yeah because how do you go on after that <laughs> you know what i mean like um that's like dave Chappelle going up and then you're like the local comedian and you're like oh crap i gotta go on after dave uh-huh <laughs> let this work um but we ended up playing and the crowd dug it the crowd got into it it was a great show um and it just felt like a homecoming. There were, yeah. um, it, it was just amazing. The vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah, that the sure. Bronx that the Bronx itself has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were other spots in the Bronx that we did play. I can't remember all of the names. The Lowdown. I think that was one. Um, the Depot. You, the Depot. The Depot, yeah, yeah. was yeah. one. Um, Black. Did you, I, I forget if you had Black Thorn. Black Thorn. That's down the road from here. Yeah. That's down the road from here, actually. 
I remember something about us playing there, but I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I was drinking it a lot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so there's sure. things that are blurry a bit. Um, but I do remember us playing in the Bronx, and the Bronx had its own vibe. Yeah. It had its own vibe for hardcore shows. Manhattan, obviously, um, I guess the birthplace, some people have called it. Yeah, sure. Um, had its own thing. Queens had its own thing. Brooklyn had its own thing. Long Island had its own thing. and But the Bronx, it felt like, was special. And maybe I'm being biased because I'm from there. Sure. Um, but there was a special vibe, a certain feel to it. At yeah. these shows, it was like, I remember going to shows and seeing other bands because Lenny was like, yo, let's go check this show out. And we would go. Yeah. And I just remember the crowd of these kids, like the sweat, the intensity. The way that, you know, that they just got into the music. There was like a passion yeah. that was there. Yeah. Um, that obviously it was in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and all these places. But there was just a vibe to it. Sure, sure. There was a certain vibe that I didn't see in the other places. And it was just like this thing that to this day, I still remember. Yeah. Um, the issue is that the Bronx for some reason, could never keep it consistent. Yeah. It could never get a strong foothold and stay with it and grow. That's right. It would have its moments of growth spurts, then it would kind of come down, then it would come back up, come back down, come back up, whereas, you know, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens just, you know what I mean? It was there. That's it right. was there. No, no stable venues in the Bronx, I guess it's one one of the things, but... Right, it yeah, was that. To probably me, the biggest thing. Yeah, exactly. To yeah. me, that was it. Yeah. There was no stable place to play. Yeah. Um, But the Bronx still, when it did have its shows, people came out. Yeah. People came out. Like, I remember of all the times that I've been to shows and that we played in the Bronx and Yonkers. Some people don't consider the Yonkers the Bronx, but I look at it like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, whatever. They literally like bleed right over into each other. Yeah, and people from the Bronx did go to the Yonkers, and people from Yonkers did yep. go to the Bronx. That's so right. like, what? exactly. Um, but they traveled and they got into it, and people did represent. Yeah. People from the Bronx did go to the shows in Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, Staten Island, and it did have things going on. At yeah, that yeah, point. yeah. Um, and they did go to these shows, and there was a passion, and there was a love that was there. Because I do remember these kids getting together and going as a group. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. Where I remember one weekend seeing kids at a show, then the next weekend there'd be a show at CB's. Yeah. And you would see the same group of kids huddled together. And then the moment that first band kicked on, these kids would just lose it. Wow. And just go off and be in there. Um, but again, like you said, you brilliantly put it, there was never a stable venue. For the Bronx to grow. Yep. And that has been the, the Achilles heel. Yep. To be honest, of the Bronx and the hardcore scene. Yep. Um, it's never been, because I've heard people say, well, it's because there's not hardcore bands in the Bronx. Anybody that says that, I will call bullshit. Yep. You've got bands from the Bronx. Billy Club Sandwich, Guadamantes, and Zaguri. Um, and I know that there's others that I'm forgetting off the top of my head, so sorry, guys, but you guys are a part of the history. Absolutely. So anybody that says that does not know, and I'm going to say this, New York hardcore. Uh -huh. Because New York hardcore is not just Brooklyn. It's not just Queens. It's not just Manhattan or Staten Island. It is all the boroughs coming together. That's right. And merging and bleeding within one another. Um, to build this this vibrant scene of bands, yeah. of love of music, appreciation of people who met and got to know each other via the scene from differing boroughs. Yes, yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that that's something that's lost, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. I think that it's something that's lost because people have this image of the Bronx. And I'm not going to lie, some of it is truthful. Yeah. Um, but... Within that perception, you lose truth and reality. Absolutely. Because I think, from my small time on this earth, that people tend to live 
in perception more than reality. At least that's my humble observation. Um, and there is this perception that the Bronx is too ghetto to have shows. The Bronx is too many criminals to have shows. The Bronx is too hip hop to have shows. There's no scene. There's nothing that comes out of the Bronx. And the reality is that that is false. Mm-hmm. For in the chamber. Not exactly. Exactly. Um, um, Dave Mitchell, who was the bass player before me, uh-huh. um, he's a guy that he could also tell you. That's right. Um, and again, the one thing I will say, when people speak of the New York hardcore scene, future documentaries or books that are written, I hope that they remember that it was a totality of things. Absolutely. It wasn't just the fact that, oh, you know, there were CBs in Manhattan and, you know, Lemoore's here and this there and the Pyramid and this, that, and the third. Yes. Yeah. Those places have their history and their foothold. They do, and they always will. But those places became great because you had people from all boroughs merging uh-huh. in those places to make them what they are. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, the clubs don't make the scene. Yeah. I'm sorry. Some people, I've said that to some people, and they've been like, no, that's not true, because what about scenes? And I'm like, okay. But if they didn't have hardcore shows, which consist of people, would CBs be what it was to the scene? I don't think so. No. Because you need the people. Yeah. The people make the scene. And if that is the argument and the case that a lot of bands say when they thank their fans, understand that the Bronx has its foothold. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Bronx has its fans. The Bronx has bands that it's put in. Um... So it has its place. Yeah. You know what I mean? It like does. it does have its place. So I do hope that people remember that. I hope that people look deeper into it. Talk to people that are from the Bronx, that go to shows um, and bands. Yeah. Just as, you know, like, where are you from? What did you do? Like, what do you remember? You know what I mean? Yeah, like what you're right. doing. That's right. Exactly yeah. what you're doing. Um, to see that we do have our place in New York. That's we right. We do have our place in there. Um, but before I forget, Adam, H2O. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I worked at Roadrunner for a bit, for, I want to say, almost a year in the mailroom. And I worked with a guy named Kevin Sears, who was like my boss. He was in a band called Judgment Day. Awesome dude. Really awesome dude. Um, and Adam came from Britain, and they got him a job there. Because he was playing in shelter at that point. Oh, I see, I see, I see. And they got him a job there, and me and Adam met that way. Like, I was one of the first people to kind of get to know him in a way. Um, And he was this young kid. We were both young. We were both learning things about the scene, about ourselves and things like that. And we got into trouble quite a bit at Road because we would... (laughs) We would just play pranks and do dumb stuff. Um, we were going off in the back and getting, you know, getting down with the herbs and whatnot. Um, he's a straight edge guy now. He's very like into his physical fitness and his body. He's, dude's like built a prime. Yeah. But back in the day, Adam, <laughs> we both know what we were. Um, and yeah, he was like that. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people, and he does admit it. Um, but he is somebody who also um, I consider family as well. Yeah. Um, but just remember that, Adam. Um, I still remember all those days. But while working there, a lot of those bands that came through, Typo Negative, yeah. Life of Agony, um, Dog Eat Dog, Sepultura. Sure. Um, I do remember working there and getting like first run test copies of uh-huh. records before they came out. Yeah. Um, like I remember hearing the Second Life of Agony record way before it was released. Wow. Because they would ship it in and we would open it up and we'd have to go give it to the person that it was going to. Yeah, sure. But it would be labeled. So I'd be like, hey, is so and so at his desk? No. Hey, man, go play this tape. It's the new life of agony. We got to hear this. Like, um, and I just remember like hearing all of these bands and just being like, wow, just being so immersed yeah, sure. in the scene and to the music at that point. Um, and, uh, 
ended up leaving that job. And then I worked at Tower Records. Oh, I see, I see. Two, in the book and records uh, intake department where they would get deliveries. I'd be one of the people to like log it and put it where it went. Yeah, sure. And um, at that point, I remember Fahrenheit was recording the EP. Okay. And um, I had this bass. And I sent it into a shop to get worked on. Peekamoose, I think, was the name of the shop. Okay. And I left Peekamoose that day, and I was walking past Tower. And they were putting up a stage for a show. Yeah. And, you know, the people there knew me, obviously, because I worked there. So I was like, oh, man, let me see what's going on. Yeah. And I spoke to one of the guys, and I, I remember meeting a couple of other people that I knew. This kid named Brian... Uh, another friend of mine named Lewis who I went to high school with and a couple of other people that they were with. And um, they were like, oh man, you don't know who's playing? And I'm like, who? They were like, the Foo Fighters are playing. And I was like, oh man, cool. And I remember I had my bass on me because I yeah. just picked it up from Peekaboo's. Yeah. So I remember stepping back and I was going to go talk to somebody who worked at the store, but I was going to go talk to them about like my shift yeah, because sure. I was doing other stuff with the band so I needed some time off. And one of the stagehands thought I was with the band <laughs> because I had the case. True story. Wow. The guy said, hey, come here. You got the instruments. I need you to go over there. And I remember <laughs> going like, oh, crap. Like, I'm being yelled at by this guy. Like, let me go see what it is. And like, another group of stagehands came and they were like all rushing. And somehow I got like mixed in with them. <laughs> and I ended up going up on stage and they were putting stuff together. And I still had the bass on my back. <laughs> and I somehow... I ended up behind the amps, oh, just right. standing there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, like, you know, I helped a couple of the guys out. Nothing big or nothing like that. Just, hey, pass me that cable to plug in. So I passed yeah, sure, it. Sure. While still having the bass. Sure enough, Foo Fighters comes on stage and plays. And there I was. They were playing outdoors. And I was behind... Uh, Taylor Hawkins, I believe, was the drummer's name. Mm. And the bass player's rig. Wow. <laughs> for the entire show. <laughs> and I remember seeing my friends out in the audience. And at one point, they saw me and they were like... <laughs> and I remember seeing them and I was like... <laughs> um, and I just remember feeling like musically in a way, seeing that show, that kid in me. That remembers Dave Grohl from Nirvana. Yeah. And that part of my life kind of came in a way in a bit of a circle. Because Foo Fighters is, uh, some people consider them grunts, some people consider them alternative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I've learned as I've gotten older, I've stopped labeling bands and music and what they are. That's right. To me, it's just music. Yeah. It's just music. Um, and I remember just being up there and going, holy crap, I am on stage and the Foo Fighters is playing. Like, this is just ridiculous. Wow. And I ended up, I, we ended up recording the EP um, with Daniel Wise. And um, I ended up swapping bases out because that one was just... <laughs> um, we recorded the EP. The EP came out. And I think more people started to get into us. We started to get it out there. We played yeah. out more. Yeah. We started to tour. We toured with H2O out to Cali. Um a lot of funny stuff on that too. I bet. Um, I bet. <laughs> um, we ended up breaking down in Salina, Kansas. The band oh, did. Oh, wow. So you've got all these Hispanic guys and a white guy. And Ray was a uh, uh, Korean in Jamaica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a van broken down in the middle of Salina, Kansas, which oh, at that point God. was the whitest place in America, probably. Uh -huh, probably so. <laughs> and I just remember uh, we ended up getting a hotel. And I just remember thinking, wow, like if the cops showed up, Lenny would have to be the one to speak for us. Uh -huh. And I remember Lenny making the joke of saying, hey, man, I'm just going to tell the cops that you all kidnapped me. That way y'all guys go and I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we obviously laughed about it, but that was a, a really amazing tour. Okay. Uh, being out on the road with H2O, um, there was a chick who, after the show, she invited us back to her house. Yeah, yeah. To crash that night and have fun. And H2O went, 
And it was Rusty from H2O, Adam, the drummer, and then us. We were ridiculously ghetto. We were still kind of ghetto kids from the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're sitting there playing craps and (laughs) CeeLo and all these games in the corner of this girl's house. Dice games. And we're like literally throwing. There's like a picture of us doing it. I'll send you the picture. It's like literally you see me. I'm like this. You see Rusty from H2O. He's got money in his hand. And we were really doing this. Wow. (laughs) And then at some point, we were drinking that night puffing all this crazy nonsense and we're in this girl's house and i just remember somebody asking for ice yeah and somebody went to the fridge and said there was no ice and i remember hearing like the little ice trays yeah sure i don't know who i'm gonna assume it was somebody in fahrenheit (laughs) peed in the girl's plant oh no no. and then peed in the ice tray and put the shit back in the fridge oh no (laughs) it wasn't me And when you ask how I know that this happened, because in the van ride, I think it was Lenny or Frank that brought up that this had happened. So, yeah. Weird. But. um, That's funny. There's like so many other things that I. We'd have to have a, a conversation off camera about some of the crazy I'm sure, other yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, but at that point in the 90s, people remember music was huge. That's MTV right. was huge. They had uh-huh. all these crazy shows. Music was everywhere. Yeah. Hip-hop, metal, the blend of the two. Yep. Um, grunge still had a bit of its foothold. Alternative was in there. Uh, all the R&B stuff. Like everything was just so amazingly good. That's right, yeah. During that time. Um, and uh, on that tour, like I said, we hit Cali. Um, I remember the beach where they used to film Baywatch. We actually went to that beach. Ah, okay. Um, and we walked around Cali for a bit. We had fun. We stayed with the guys in Powerhouse. Okay, okay, yeah. And awesome guys. So freaking awesome, awesome guys. Um, they actually held a cookout for us. Oh, wow. At a tattoo shop. Um, and just amazing guys. Yeah. Just amazing guys. Um, and it shows, again, that hardcore, it's a blending yep. of things. Whether you're from the Bronx, Manhattan, or the West Coast. Uh-huh. Um, if there's the love for music and the passion for music, people will blend. That's right. And that, to me, was an example of that. Because you had these bands from Cali, these bands from New York, playing together in shows, mixing it up, hanging out afterwards, <laughs> um, and doing all these fun, amazing things. Um, and just even the people in the bands... Um, Vision, I believe, was on one of those tours, okay, and the singer okay. who passed away. Um, awesome guy as well. Um, I remember I've got a picture of him somewhere that I've got to send the drummer Paul. Of um, we were in front of the club, and I just remember saying "Hey," and then I took a picture, and he's like picking his nose. <laughs> uh, it was just like it's the funny things that you see and do. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking back on it, um, but we came back. Um. We were playing out, and I believe at this point, we probably should have taken a bit of a break. Yeah, sure. Um, We were all doing and going through different things in our lives, um, and it just felt like so much stuff was happening at once, and there was like an intensity to it, Um, and with intensity, there's only two things. It's going to turn positive, or it's going to go negative. Yeah. for us, unfortunately, it went in a negative route, and I think it was because, again, we didn't take a break from each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's almost like a marriage. A band is a marriage. Sure. You know what I mean? Because you're in the relationships with these people. Um, you're always around each other. You're sharing different aspects of your life yeah. with them. And it, people that are in bands know. Yeah. Um, and we should have taken a bit of a break from one another to go through the things that we were going through in our lives individually. Sure. Um, but we didn't. We just pressed forward. And at that point, we got a deal with Zamba through our friend Howie. Um, we put together and wrote some other songs, recorded them. And everything kind of just came to a bit of a head at that point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and I think a lot of it is our own fault internally. I think that, and the other guys would disagree, but everybody looks at things differently. Sure. Um, there were egos within the band. Um, 
as well as viewpoints of how the band should be that didn't always align with what everybody else thought. I see, I see. Um, which led to the eventual breakup of the band. Sure. Um, and then at that point, everybody kind of went their separate ways. Yeah. Um, we were still involved. Like, we still went to shows. Sure, sure. Still hung out. Like, I still hung out with Lenny um, a lot because he literally lived 20 minutes from me. At yeah. That point still. Yeah, that's right. Um, he went to go do different bands. I went and helped out uh, with a friend of mine's band. Um, and we kind of took our break from the scene. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. Or, around what year? Uh, that like early 2000s? I want to say, what, 99? Oh, okay, okay. That 2000, 99. somewhere yeah, in that time like that. frame? Yeah. Well, the Lenny will probably murder me for not getting it right, but I want to say it is that time frame. Sure, sure. Um, we all kind of dispersed went our own different ways. Um, like I said, the only ones who really spoke at that point was me and Lenny. Yeah. Everybody else just kind of did this into their own thing. Yeah. Um, I still went to shows here and there. Sure. Um, still had friends that went to shows, still did things. Um, <clears throat> Lenny still went to some shows here and there. Uh, but uh, Lenny got into the union work, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I ended up joining the military, and I was the one person in the band who, um, and anybody that knew me would sit there and be like, you? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, I ended up joining the military, which um, if everybody, everybody who knew me then and knew who I was um, knew that I was the goofy, crazy guy that was always puffing and drinking um, and that gave zero fucks that I would just go out and do what I was going to go do. Yeah. Um, it was a shock um, because it's just not something that you would see from somebody that I was back then. Yeah, sure. Um, and everybody knows the military is a very regimented uh, lifestyle. It's a complete change of life, basically. Um, so people didn't know how to take it. People were in shock. I had people telling me, oh, you're never going to make it. What are you doing? You can't do that. Yeah. You know, you're this guy and you're going to go do that. And um, the thing that I think it was like people just didn't know how to react. Sure. So there was a lot of negativity from my friends um, around it. There were friends who supported it. Sure. But there were a lot of friends who just didn't know what to do with that. What branch? Did you um, I ended up going. Originally, I was supposed to be Navy. Okay. Um, I went in. I took what's called the ASVAB test, which tells you what job sure. you're going to get and your intelligence level. And I scored pretty decently high. And they wanted me to basically be. Um, they were going to put me as somebody who worked on nuclear sub equipment. Oh, wow. Because, like I said earlier, my dad was somebody that was a bit of a mechanic, and I grew up with him doing that. So I am good with my hands in terms of mechanical, electronics, and stuff like that. Um, but the day that I was supposed to go sign for the job, the recruiter didn't show up. The Air Force recruiter guy showed up. This guy, Staff Sergeant Rodriguez. So I'm sitting there waiting. I was supposed to be there at 7. Got there at 7. I'm sitting there waiting. 8 o'clock rolls around. 9 o'clock rolls around. This guy doesn't show up, and I'm starting to get angry. Yeah. Air Force recruiter goes, hey, who are you for? And I said, oh, I'm here to meet the guy from the Navy. And he goes, wait a minute. You're Latino and you're going to join the Navy? And I was like, <laughs> well, 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 like, you know what I mean? I was yeah, like, sure. why? He was like, dude, they're going to put you on a boat with a bunch of other dudes. Do you want to wake up to a sausage fest? <laughs> and then it hit me. I was like, wait a minute. Oh, crap, yeah. <laughs> crap, yeah. I was like, yeah, no, no, like, no. And then he goes, hey. And he pulls out this brochure. And it's got like, you know, you know, the typical military stuff. Everybody that's all cool and badass with their yeah, gear. Yeah, yeah. And then like the next page is like, you know, people working like medical jobs and you see all these chicks and he's like, we've got girls. <laughs> and I was like, sign me up. <laughs> um, so I ended up completing my paperwork with him. Uh, I went in, I got my job and I got put into originally, uh, people didn't know I worked as an armed Guard at Mount Sinai Hospital. Oh, okay. I had that job for a bit. Um, and uh, when you sign up for the military, they look at things that you've done at your past, as well as your ASVAB score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had all my paperwork in line, everything that was good. So at first, they were going to make me security forces, which is basically an Air Force cop. Okay. But that you go into Office of Special Investigations, which is like their version of the CIA slash FBI. Oh, okay. I see, I see. Um, and my sister saw that I joined. She wanted to join. Yeah. And my sister, uh, Mercy, we call her Percy, um, 
she went and took the ASVAB, and I think she scored a couple points higher than me. She wanted that job because she was a big Law & Order SVU fan. Uh-huh. So she kind of went, oh, I want to go be a cop and do this, that, and the third. And I was like, all right, cool. So we both went in. She took that job. I get put into fire truck maintenance. Okay. Which I was like, okay, cool. Like, I like working with my hands. I remember uh, helping my dad rebuild a 1976 Ford Mustang wow. on the street in New York City. Wow. Pulled the transmission out, oh rebuilt God. it, did the engine, rebuilt that. Um, and I was like, well, screw it. You know what I mean? Like, that's cool. Like, I can definitely do that. Like, whatever. Um, went back, um, and I remember Lenny, his dad was previous Air Force. Yeah. And I went back and I was speaking with them about it, and they were really happy and supportive. Lenny and the family were, because obviously they come from a military family. Yeah. Uh, my family, of course, was like, wait, you? <laughs> you. <laughs> you, you, you like you took the test, passed it, and they're letting you in. You <laughs> and they were like my sister. They could see it because my sister Mercy was the studious one. She yeah, was sure. the one that was, you know what I mean. Like I could see everybody could see her uh, being into that, and they were like, again, you. I was like, yeah, yeah. me. <laughs> so I ended up getting. Um, put in process I got my date to leave for basic training um, and I'll never forget it um, I had gone dry from smoking weed and drinking for a bit because they yeah. test you yeah sure 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 and I remember I was coming back from Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn with the recruiter because I'd signed for my job I was given my date to leave for basic training which was like a month of change later yeah and I'm in the car with him and I don't know if you remember or anybody remembers next time Oh, the cell phone company yes, that you would go yes. boop, boop. Yep. <laughs> so we all had that so I you know amongst us the joke was you would boop, boop, somebody <laughs> so I boop, boop, Lenny and then I'm like yo like I got my stuff like I got my date and Lenny was like oh when are you leaving and I was like oh I'm like I'm leaving a month from now he was like okay cool so you're like gonna come up and, and we're gonna like smoke this blunt right <laughs> and the recruiter was literally in the car sitting next to me he's driving and he just looks at me. He just goes, hey, man, just be sure to be clean before you leave. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, Lenny. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, like, I went back. You know, um, I had a celebratory L with Lenny. Um, and, you know, his family congratulated me. I went and I told everybody else that I was leaving. I gave everybody a date and all that. Um, and then I prepared to go in. I leave for basic training. And my T.I., actually knew who I was. Oh. Because he saw Fahrenheit on tour. Oh, wow. That's and wild. he only recognized me because at that point, I had shaved my head, obviously, military, yeah, sure. I had shaved my beard, but he recognized me because of the tattoo that I had, which is uh, F451. Okay, okay. Um, and he pulled me aside one day. He's like, I know you from somewhere. And I'm like, you know, Sir Trainee Smith for Portage Order, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and he's like, at ease. And he's like, I know I know you from somewhere. And I'm like, okay. And he looks at my arm, because you can see the bottom part of my tattoo yeah, yeah. from where my uniform was at. And he goes, you were in a band. And I was like, yes, sir. And he's like, wait a minute. Stay right there. Runs out. Comes back in five minutes later. Mind you, I'm standing at attention. My legs are fucking tired and hurting. <laughs> Runs yeah. back in. He actually had the Fahrenheit EP. Oh, wow. He walked back in with it. And he was like, that's you. <laughs> and mind you, I am still out of tension. And I'm like, oh, my God. What the hell? Because at this point in that life, insane. I had removed myself from all that to yeah, be sure. and do something completely different. And I was just like, oh, crap. Okay. How? And I'm thinking, how is this going to play out? Yeah. Yeah. He was like, dude, I saw you guys on tour in Arizona, and I loved you guys, and that band, H2O, they were really cool, too. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, my God. This guy, for the past two freaking weeks, has been yelling at me, getting up my ass. And all of a sudden now, he's like, yeah, calm down. Like, we're cool and all this. And I'm like, okay, where the fuck is this guy? <laughs> but um, I asked him to not say anything about it. Yeah, sure. Um, to treat me like everybody else. Sure. To not treat me any differently because he's like, hey, man, I'm going to, like, hook you up. You know, when we're at the child hall you guys are eating, I'm not going to yell at you to get up and throw your shit away. You deserve to eat. And I'm like, no, treat me like everybody else. Yeah, yeah, I am yeah, yeah. no different than anybody else sure. on this earth. Um, 
made it through, graduated, went to my school. Um, and while I was at my school, there was a Fahrenheit 451 reunion show. Oh, wow. At Seabees. Wow. Flew in, snuck in. <laughs> um, made this show. And like I, I remember I flew in. That Friday night, I think we played the show Sunday. We didn't even get a we didn't even get a chance to practice. Wow. We played the show Sunday and I immediately hopped in a cab and went back to JFK to fly wow. back out to Cali. Wow. Uh, to be a formation the next morning at zero five thirty, which oh is five thirty in the morning. Oh my god. Um and I flashed from New York to Cali, I think it was like five hours or yeah, something yeah. like that. Um Yeah. So insane. Yeah, and I've had my career. Um, in the military, played it. We Fahrenheit has obviously played reunion shows here and there. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and I remember at one point, I was deployed to Iraq, my first deployment. Wow. And we were at Cobb Adder, this base called Cobb Adder Talil. It was in the butthole of Iraq. Yeah. Um, we were on our own. This base was literally situated on its own. If something happened, we had no help for hours. Wow. And I remember at one point, this was at the drawdown of the war. We were turning the base back over to the Iraqi military. Yeah. And there was just 300 of us left on that base. Yeah. And we were surrounded by Iraqi military. Yeah, we sure. didn't trust at that point um, because some of them had killed Americans. So yeah, there was sure. this big divide of distrust. And I remember at one point we were putting vehicles back on the plane. And there was a fire truck that I was driving because I was the fire truck mechanic and I had a bullhorn. Yeah. Like when you see the fire trucks coming, you hear the sirens and the horns. And there was these Iraqis marching. And I kept beeping for them to get out of my way and they wouldn't. So what did I do? I played Rain and Blood by Slayer <laughs> through the freaking loudspeaker. Those Iraqi soldiers took off running. I blasted Rain and Blood all the way to the flight line. <laughs> and um, when I pull up to the plane, um, I hop out. I, I, I stop the CD player because it was con I connected it to the to the bullhorn thing. And one of the guys looks at me. He's like, "Dude, you like Slayer?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh well, yeah, who doesn't like fucking Slayer?" Yeah, like, hello. Yeah. Like, really? You really asking me that? And he was like, "Dude, like we love Slayer." We got into this long conversation about it. Turns out this kid had seen sick of it all. Oh my god. <laughs> so again, you see how hardcore. Like I said earlier, no matter where you're from, yeah. there is a bridge and, and uh, a mutuality, I guess. Yeah, people. sure. And I told him, I was like, oh, yeah, I've seen Sick of It All. I didn't say who I was. I just said, hey, I've seen Sick of It All. I've seen a bunch of other bands. And, you know, like, you know, we've conversated. And we're cool. And um, I get on the plane. And I was going to come home. We made a stop somewhere else. I can't say where. Yeah. Uh, we made a stop somewhere else. And... Uh, what's that show where they have the people sing and you get judged by that dude Simon Cowell? Oh, what is it? America's Got ta Talent? Or talent not, or the uh, singing or one? Or is it uh, The Voice? Something. You know which one, one it is. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, people yeah. know. The very first season had Kelly Clarkson, some chick, and then there was a guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simon Cowell, right? Yeah, but the guy, the guy that came in third place started a band. Oh, oh, oh. I got you. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. He started a band and they had a really big single. Yeah. They were playing a USO show at that base. Oh. He was bald. I remember he was bald. And I remember getting to where the side of the stage was. We're still unloading gear. I'm still fully loaded. Uh, you know, vest, my weapon and all that shit. And I'm walking towards the side of the stage. And I think they had just finished. He was walking off the stage. Like, I pull off my helmet. And I go like this. And I just look at the stage. Because obviously I've been yeah. in a band before. So I'm, and I'm a gear nerd. Yeah, sure. So I'm looking to see what they had. He comes down and we bump into each other. We stare at each other. And we both at the same time said, hey, you look like me. <laughs> and we looked at each other and we did look a lot alike. <laughs> to where other people were like, yo, are you two related? <laughs> like people were asking this. And he was the number three guy for that year that Kelly Clarkson won. Huh. I can't remember his name now. Like Kevin something. Or maybe something else I can't remember. Um, but... It's just the funny places that you end up in life and the things that happen. It's funny. Um, so I ended up coming back. I was in Korea for a year. Okay. Deftones played. Oh, wow. When Sergio was in the band in Korea. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. Um, and I went to that show. And um, Sergio may not remember. 
Um, but we did glance at each other. There was a bit of, like, we knew each other. Yeah, sure. Um, but, you know, obviously, it was Deftones. A lot of stuff was going on. I was with my friends in the audience. Yeah, yeah. But there was that glance of, do I know you from somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, again, New York hardcore coming up in places. That's right. Um, two, fast two bass players from the Bronx. The <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and somebody who I did look up to. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? And fast forward, I ended up getting stationed um, in New Jersey. Um, Lenny was doing um, bands. Um, I wasn't doing anything at that point, which kind of made me sad because everybody else was doing their thing. Yeah. I ended up joining a band called Another Distraction. But they're like a rock kind of band out of New Jersey. Yeah, sure. Great group of guys, awesome musicians. Um, I recorded an EP with them, and there's a couple videos out there. I'll send them to you. Okay. And it's completely different from hardcore. Sure, sure. Um, but it was that side of me that was there as a kid. Yeah. Like, I threw my Alice in Chains part of who I was into that band. Absolutely. Um, and then fast forward down the line, Crazy Eddie. Uh-huh. Um, I played a couple of shows. Obviously, there were Fahrenheit things here and there. Yeah. Um, Crazy Eddie came up to now to where Fahrenheit was brought back into the mix. Uh-huh. To where we are to the day. With the two new songs that we've put out, um... And to see where basically the road takes us. Sure. Um, these two songs that we put out, we didn't sign with anyone to do them because um, we've always felt a bit of independence from labels. Um, we've looked at labels like they can be good because they put your music out there, they promote the bands, um, they bring about new music to people that may not have had it before. They put music in places that it's not normally at. Yeah. That's really a lot of what they do. But we've always shied away from it because we look at it like we don't want to be packaged as something that we're not. That's right. We don't want to be pushed into being like, hey, we're signing you because we like you because you're this type of band. And then we record something and then they go, wait a minute. We don't know how to package that. Yeah. So can you be this type of band? Yeah. Um, and we look at it like in people who listen to music Guys in bands know this is a common practice. That's right. Because they don't know how to package you. They don't know what to say about you, how to describe you, and at times even what bill to put you on. Yeah, yeah. So right. they try to push you into being one thing when you're not. Um, it's one of the reasons why Fahrenheit never, at least to me, never really got involved in the label. Yeah. Because yeah. we didn't want to be... Um, put into something that you're forced to be one way when the beauty of that band was and is that we are not one thing. Yeah, sure. We're not. We've got hardcore elements, metal elements, rock elements, blues, alternative, um, just everything hodgepodge together. Yeah, And right. if you sign with a label... It's like you're selling a piece of yourself. Yeah. Because you're signing on that line. This is, I'm giving you ownership of a part of me. Yeah. Which is your music, which is personal. Um, but, like I said, they may not know what to do with it. So they may go, we want you to be this. And again, like I said earlier, that thing of living in perception versus reality. Yeah, sure. Comes into play again, which is why I said before, I think a large portion of people live in perception yeah. versus what reality is in terms of how they view the box, in terms of how they view New York hardcore, in terms of how they view bands mm -hmm. um, from the scene. Like we spoke of 24 seven spies. Yeah. That was a band live. They put on a show. People were going nuts. They just brought a certain energy, but their label, I guess, didn't know how to package that. Yeah. And, um, I guess shows and people putting on shows may not know how to package that or what bill to put them on. Yeah. Um, there's other bands, even famous bands, Living Color. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. That's a band who's got songs that you hear, Cult of Personality, uh -huh. that riff, you know that song. You get up, you vibe, you feel it. It gives you that thing. But notice how that's just one of those bands that you never really saw them on major bills. That's right. That's right. And they still play out. Yep. Like, I still hear their stuff, and 
I'm like, they still are that band that did that song, but yeah. you don't see it because, again, there's that perception of what people think they are and what they want them to be versus what they actually are. That's right. You know what I mean? Like, um, and I think that that's a huge thing. And it's a thing that plagues the scene at times um, where people think that bands should be this way or that they are that and they're not. Um, there's little things. There's a perception that um, that there is, uh, I guess, a certain type of bias or bigotry yeah. in a certain way that I've heard. Sure. Um, and I'll speak for myself. Yeah. I've never experienced that in the scene, me personally. Has it happened? I'm sure it probably has, but I've never experienced it within the New York hardcore community, sure. me personally. Um, you've got people that are of color, bad lines. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, Freddie Manball, Hispanic, uh -huh. I'm crying out loud. Roger. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? As well as so many other people. Armand from um, Sick of It All. Yep. He's Middle Eastern. You know what I mean? Like, um, and people just in other bands that come from different places that contribute to the scene. Sure. Um, so again, there's some people's um, perception of certain things, and then there's a reality to it. And again, even with that, at times there are gray areas yeah, yeah. within those two things where they do bleed into each other. That's why I said I've never experienced bigotry or bias or whatever yeah. um, in the New York hardcore scene yeah. because I've made friends with people who are come from all different places and in the time that I came up race was never a thing sex was never a thing people didn't care if you were black white Asian Hispanic gay straight transgender nobody cared yeah. the one thing people cared about is were you a good person yeah yeah were you a good person to the people around you that's it you know what I mean because sure. we hung out with people that were gay at shows we had sure. friends that were gay we had friends that were white, black, Asian, Hispanic. I mean, hell, look at Fahrenheit. Yeah, exactly. It, you know what I mean? Like, that's a mixed band as hell. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And um, we were, in a way, at times, I looked at it in my own brain at times. It was like we were a hodgepodge of the scene. Yeah, sure. Because sure. Lenny came from the more traditional hardcore thing. That's right. Frank came from, like, the metal side of things because yeah. he had this metal influence. Um Armando came from metal um, and hip hop. I came in from the rock and more grunge alternative things, and That's right. we all met in this scene yeah. and put out what we did yeah. the same way every other band in this scene has done. Sure, as well. Bands from the Bronx. You've got bands from the Bronx. You know, Forna Chamber, Enziguri, um, Guadamente's, Billy Club Sandwich, where members are from different places. Yeah. And their heart is here in the Bronx, but it's a hodgepodge of things. Sure. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like there's um, the influence from everything being put into it. And it's like a, it's like a pot. Yeah. Like a, like a gumbo pot. Yeah. To yeah, me, yeah, 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 yeah. that's what the New York hardcore scene. It is a big gumbo pot. Of many things thrown in and everybody takes their plate and their flavor and they eat it and they love it and they bring it in. Um, and it becomes what it is. Yeah. It really, truly does. Um, and it's it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing that years later, it's still here, um, that we're still able to play out. Um, I, don't, I will say this. I don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to see about maybe another Malawi show. And I'm not advertising it like it's going to happen, so don't take it like that. Um, oh my God. Just that that was such an amazing standpoint that it's something that should happen again. And it happened for a few years in the 90s, right? Um, I believe so, but then it stopped. Then it stopped, yep. Which is what we went on before about the consistency Yeah. in the, the Bronx uh, foothold within the scene. But uh, Malali's is still there. Yep. Um, and I've seen that they've done things here and there. Um, so I'm not going to say that it is going to happen because I don't want people to go, oh, my God, the show is going to happen. And then it doesn't. But just know that it is something that um, 
people do want to happen. Yeah, 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 sure. And the building blocks are there. It's just getting everything in place to build on that and make it happen. Yep, absolutely. Because um, it would be an amazing thing to bring the hodgepodge of things back here. Absolutely. And even if it's for one day, for six hours, um, to give the Bronx something back. Yep. You know what I mean? Give it like, give it that shot in the arm that maybe um, gives birth to something here. Yeah. That can become stable. That these bands that came before are uh, now and gave their bit of history of Four in the Chamber, who's doing stuff again, Guadamantes, Billy Club, Enziguri, who's from here, um, and the other bands that have done things here, that they get that injection back into it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that they show that the Bronx doesn't breed herbs. That's right. It breeds people who are warriors, yep. who bring the A game just like anybody else. We just do it in our own way. So, absolutely. Well, on, on that note, here's here's a question for you uh, that that I like asking near the uh, end of end of these interviews. You know, whether with hardcore or metal bands from the Bronx, um, uh, is there a Bronx hardcore sound? Would you say? And what does that sound like if there is? You could just answer no um, if you think the answer is no. Um, it's hard to give an answer to that, and yeah. I'll say why. Because people in bands come from different places, musically and ethnically, culturally. Um, guys in the Bronx that are in bands, you got a lot of Hispanics, a lot of African Americans. Um, we don't purely come up from certain musical styles. That's right. We come from a more mixed blend of things. Like I said, salsa, merengue, reggae. And then there's that shock of metal, of hardcore, of hard music, death metal, all of that in there. There's a mix. That's right. So I think it may not have its own sound because we all sound different from each other. That's right. But there's a feel. There's an attitude. There's a way that the bands put themselves out on stage that has that Bronx flavor, which is a bit of being smooth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Um, but then there's that edge that the Bronx as a borough has. Yes, there's criminality. Yes, there's ghetto stuff. Yes, there's crime. Yes, but remove those things for a second for the scope of the context of the concert, of the conversation. Yeah. What you're left with is a borough of vibrancy, of dedication, hard work, and heart. That people from the Bronx, we wear it here. Yeah. We wear it here on our sleeves. We wear it here in our hearts. Um, I think that is what Bronx brings to hardcore. Absolutely. I think that's more what it is because the sound, you can't describe sound. That's right. Music, you know that's what right. I mean? Because it's a hard thing to quantify. And again, label. Yeah. It's a feeling. Yep. You know what I mean? Because you've got bands that from one record to the next, it's a different thing. Absolutely. And then people say, oh, well, they changed their sound. Okay, but why marry the concept of a certain type of sound to a band? Yep, that's right. Why do that? Yeah. There's evolution in everything that we do. We grow, we go through different things. Um, I'm sure that you're not the same person you were when you were five years old. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you can look back on certain things and be like, man, I wouldn't do that again. Yeah, same sure. thing with me. For sure. You know what I mean? I've done things where I'm like, oh, man, I really did that? <laughs> Crap. Oh, no. Let me go back in once and tell myself, don't do that. <laughs> but it's the same thing. Yeah. We grow, we learn, we evolve. We become different things. Music is no different than that. Yeah. So what the Bronx has, it's a feel. Yeah. That's what we have. In my humble opinion, again, vibrancy, dedication, heart, emotion, drive, passion, and an edge. Yeah. That is what the Bronx brings to New York hardcore. Yeah. 
It's like Sick of It All song, Get Bronx. Um, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, I think Sick of It All. They're not even from the Bronx, but they recognize it. <laughs> they recognize it. But those guys, even them, yeah. they're so merged in New York. Yep. Like they all know because they've been in it so long. They've all traveled. They know what New York City hardcore is. To yeah. me, at least to me humbly, they're the one band, I call them the Knights of New York hardcore. Yeah. Just like to me, the Bad Brains are the godfathers That's right. they of are. New York hardcore. Madball and AF, they're the enforcers <laughs> yes. of New York hardcore. You know what I mean? Yeah, like sure. That's just me, how when I think about these bands, that's what I think of them as yeah. on that tier. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or maybe I've been watching House of Dragons way too long. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I like I say in my mind how I look at them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So and they all know New York City has its own sound. That's right. And each borough puts into it and the center of it all, Manhattan, because it had CDs, wetlands, and all these other cool places, is the merging of it. Yeah. Yeah. But the Bronx brings this part. Queens, Brooklyn, Long Island, Staten Island, all these places bring their part. And all these places seem to have um, the recognition of that. Yeah. They seem to have their own recognition of that, whereas the Bronx never had it. So this is an amazing thing because it shows and gives light to what the Bronx has done with all the bands that have come from it, that they've played these shows, That's that they've right. toured with these bands. They bring the hard work, dedication, vibrancy, love, edge to the scene as well. Yeah, that's so, right. Uh, what I can say is, get Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kevin. Is there anything else you'd like to, to add to in the interview? Um, thank you for bringing um, the light to something within New York hardcore that not that many people know about. Um to give the Bronx its voice yeah. because you're doing that. Um, and I hope that other people from these bands um, give the love and the dedication to it, but that the fans as well go out there, buy the records from these bands, support these bands, go to the shows. Um, and even if you can't, because I get it, life gets in the way, we're all working, busy, people have families and, de and yeah. responsibilities that stream the music. That's right. Even if you order the merch online from their Instagram or Facebook page, do that. Yeah. Support them in that way because it does put them out there. That's right. You know what I mean? It does show support. The same way if you wear a Sick of It All or an AF shirt or a Madball shirt, go out and buy a Four in the Chamber, Inzaguri, Guadamante's, Billy Club Sandwich. Um, go old school and go out and buy a 24-7 Spice shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Go out and show the equal love because these bands – they put in there everything that they could. Yeah. Just like Sick of It All, AF, Madball, and all these other bands. So show these guys some love. Buy their music. And again, thank you. Thank you for doing this and bringing light to the Boogie Down. Again, get Bronx.